Hello and welcome to the Wireless Watch podcast. My name is Ellie Whitaker and I'm joined this morning by my colleagues Philip Hunter. Uh, hello again. And Alex Davis. Hello. We are going to jump in in a moment to our chat about our stories from this week. But I will just give a quick plug. Our Fixed Wireless Access report is out. Go and have a look. And next Wednesday on October the 9th, we're going to have a live webinar hosted by Alex about the standards world and get a bit of background information into how that whole system works. We've got the GSA, we've got the Telecom Infrastructure Project and the Open Technology Institute of New America. So tune in, sign up, join us next Wednesday. As always, rethinkresearch.biz for our content. And we're going to kick off with Phil, who's going to tell us about his stories this week and focus on what a lot of us are looking at, or at least receiving news on, which is Ericsson's views on the EU AI Act. Yes, uh, thank you, Ellie. Um, as you say, I'll just say a few words about three other stories because they sort of um, follow themes that we've been picking up on in recent months, or in one case, sort of picking up that's something that we wrote about a while back, and that is um, MVNOs, which um, and what um, AI means for them. And um, I talk, I, I, I pick up what we last wrote about MVNOs, which was really came um, just after Mobile World Congress this year, when we talked about the role that the eSIM is playing in sort of helping them become global roaming brokers and get more into IoT traffic and so on. And um, in this piece, we look at um, what um, generative AI is doing or why it's generating some interest amongst um, MVNOs for helping them sort of get to grips with the data that they can get access on through their MNO partners and how they can exploit that. Then in a, another piece this week, um, we, we, co we come back to India, but this time looking at its sort of um, uh, ambitions in becoming a much more serious um, chip making country sort of <clears throat> and getting sort of further up the technology <clears throat> levels towards the higher end processes processes you know sort of talking about five and down below seven nanometer process which and that just equates roughly to the size of transistors <clears throat> because at the moment they are al already a significant player higher up and uh, in the piece I essentially argue that there's no imminent prospect of them competing at the very top end of the process and over the likes of TSMC and Samsung but that they are becoming a more a, a significant player nonetheless at some some important uh, um, technologies and um, we look at how in the wake of President Biden's recent visit they're setting up a joint chip manufacturing plant with the US uh, focusing on three technologies which are gallium nitride, silicon carbide and infrared and um, the first two of those to some extent work um, and there's a synergy between them although they also have individual applications and I talk about some of those for example um, gallium nitride handling higher power levels better and therefore coming into its own for millimeter wave processes and um, infrared as a um, add-on to existing devices because it, it adds sort of um, sensing and mass spectrometry and so on and will add further to the utility of smartphones so I discuss that and, and then the, in, in another piece I look at um, and I look at um, what's happening in the automotive side in part uh, in, in, in partnerships with them um, the, the hyperscalers, I, I talk about Volkswagen's sort of getting together with Google Cloud and, um, and and whether that's really just for in, in kind of infotainment or making mm. a, a difference elsewhere. And I make, I make the point that the major automotive makers are actually sort of keeping their cars close to their chest for the, uh, the more competitive applications of AI to advanced driving systems for example but the main thing my main my main focus this week was on um the eu's a i act and um how it's come under 
criticism, not just from the usual suspects, you might say, um, the big American tech companies, but also some European companies, several of them, Ericsson being most notable in this kind, but also others, sort of SAP and also Spotify. Um, and the reason it's all about sort of, uh, it's, it's all about data, really. It's all about the um, the data sets that uh, can be permissible for training large language models and the arguments that um, the likes of Ericsson are putting are that um, if the AI Act is, comes into force as it, well, it has come into force, but if it continues, <laughs> um, then um, it will make it harder to have a European flavour to sort of a lot of major AI applications in terms of language, culture and uh, and so on. And um, so I discussed these issues and quite why um, these European companies take a different view over the AI Act than they did over, say, GDPR and some of the other EU um, regulations, which they've um, generally, uh, generally been more supportive of. You know, in the past, they brought the argument that um, Europe stands to gain rather than lose by being ahead rather than behind over regulatory matters and that if, if Europe sort of sets the global standards for regulations and European companies in theory ought to stand to benefit although that's not actually proved to be the case and, uh, I, and I, I go on to say why they've taken a different view over the AI, AI Act as I've largely said um, but interestingly as I say there's already a sign that these measures are backfiring and um, that these companies are sort of um, really sort of explaining that uh, some revisions are needed and that harmonise consistent, quick and clear decisions. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's partly sort of consistency they're also arguing for generally over the EU position rather than the uncertainty over what they may or may not be able to do next year. So that's partly what they're calling for, a bit more clarity. So, I mean, there is perhaps some scope for wriggle room there in the EU, perhaps sort of softening its position a bit and sort of perhaps giving some more clarity over what's going to be coming along. And um, I do also in the <clears throat> piece mention Nokia because Nokia did not um, sign the letter and they seem to be taking a, um, a slightly different, taking a different, different line through a, a, an AI pact that they uh, promoting, which is a kind of voluntary framework, and they're suggesting that companies should prepare for compliance with it and sort of almost mitigate its impact rather than try to change it. So that's about the um, size of it. Mm, and again, there's, we're seeing quite a lot of that recently when, um, I mean, I'm sure that's always been the case, but Ericsson says one thing and Nokia says another, but it seems quite stark to see such a different response to the AI Act when there's a fairly unanimous voice that says, from the business community that says this isn't quite this isn't really going to work for us uh interesting yeah, to hear yeah. such a difference of opinion well i think i think definitely it was one to follow up on because i i can i can you can maybe sort of come back and say that nokia perhaps after all is sort of <clears throat> concerned or not but mm. I, I wasn't able to get comment from them in time for the that piece mm. 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 there was a sense that they just wanted to look like they were you know doing their homework properly yeah yeah we'll yeah. see how that goes thank you phil uh moving over to alex who's been looking at nvidia and their sort of t-mobile announcements in the last week yeah yeah cheers early the yeah ai kind of hype is something we've seen sort of impact our, our stock tracker where a lot of the like early enthusiasm uh, from like the investment types seems to have like petered out and there's been a few kind of high profile um, blogs from you know significant influential investors who who are questioning AI return on investment and and so that's kind of the lens that I was viewing this news from and the news is that T-Mobile has announced a technology partnership with Ericsson and Nvidia and so they're they're setting up a new R&D hub in the USA, and they're going to explore how AI-based technologies can be used in the RAN. And so this is essentially a commercial vehicle for NVIDIA's Aerial, and Aerial was kind of unveiled at the start of the year, and it's a kind of 
system, I guess, where NVIDIA benefits from deploying distributed compute hardware into the m and networks. And there's going to be a revenue sharing function where any edge computing that happens on those you know, servers are essentially inside the RAN, the m will get some cash for it. And so all the usual questions about hype and who's actually going to use this and will my robo surgery you know device actually need to run inside the t-mobile ran um c- could it not run on on premises somewhere does it need to be edge can it not just be general cloud all, all the usual kind of edge versus cloud questions like does does a major it department trust their mobile provider when there's a very good chance that inside the very building where they're making that you know business decision the conference room may not have a very good mobile signal but like it doesn't kind of instill trust so that's that's the kind of frame i guess that i'm i'm looking at it i admit i am quite cynical and jaded but yeah the aerial piece has it seems to have been softly rebranded as ai aerial to kind of push push this uh slightly buzzier i I guess connotation Mm, mm. um but the sort of the ulterior motive for nvidia is i need to sell as many of these things as i can and this is a way for me to sell them and if you are the mno that has gone into this listening to a lot of the hype and you've essentially fallen for the sales pitch and you've purchased deployed and committed to support these things and suddenly no one is really using them then that's a major cost for you. And as usual, in all of these air quotes, partnerships, no one actually talks about how the money changes hand, who pays for what. But it's very clear that NVIDIA is standing to be paid twice for the sale of the thing and then the use of the thing, which is not bad, not bad for business, really. But yeah, I I think I think there has to be a kind of wariness here from from this this uh, this approach. And if you are a mobile network operator, you need to be kind of considering like, yeah, what is the what is the ulterior issue here? And there's a there's a risk that the MNOs are left kind of footing the bill because this feels quite early for yeah, I mean we're working on an edge compute forecast now. Um so we'll have we'll have a solid opinion of this soon. But this this you know, NVIDIA AI aerial project with the T Mobile feels a few years. Um, ahead of the curve so mm, yeah mm, mm. yeah this is sort of 6g more of that glorious 6g excitement that we all that we mm. know everybody loves to hear about <laughs> yes <indeed. clears throat> um thank you alex i am going to jump in on my story about spacex and their plans to change the regulations in the us around leo satellite power, density, flux, rules. Um, The long and short of it is SpaceX want to change the power density regulations for LEO satellites so that their satellite constellation can be more powerful and do a better job of providing um, internet services from space. They pitch it to the FCC as they, and they always say this, uh, we provide mission critical uh, coverage to areas that are not provide not covered by the public networks, you know, which can potentially save American lives um, in a crucial moment. But I think the point to remember when they make these petitions is that they they already have uh, direct to device text uh, capabilities, and what they're really pushing for is uh, voice and data. So uh, I think if you are stuck in a national park or out of uh, a mobile n- network zone, you are probably going to be safe with using text to contact the emergency services. And um, I think we need to be wary of big corporations pushing uh, their agenda in, in a way that does affect the whole satellite ecosystem. Now, the the World Radio Communications Conference, which doesn't happen very regularly, we were just discussing this, it happens maybe every four years or so. Uh, it's possible that system is a bit archaic. It needs updating and it needs to work with, you know, a much more lively space ecosystem than the one that it was designed to officiate originally. 
but certainly Elon Musk and the big egos of uh, the American billionaires is definitely not the solution to uh, uh, finding a new normal. So that was my my piece for this week. I'm going to wrap it up there, but please do check out our stories. Uh, check out the uh, Fixed Wireless Access Report and sign up for the webinar next Wednesday afternoon. So with that, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. And bye from me.